Good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you are joining us from. My name is Meg Dehan. I'll be your webinar host for today. We're very pleased to have with us here Dr. Tarek King. Dr. King has a bachelor degree, a master degree, and a PhD degree in computer science. Uh, however, I'm sure some of you have already heard him or have seen him out there in the media. He's, a, he's an amazing uh, conference speaker, internationally recognized. Uh, conference speaker. He has written over 40 articles published in very reputable uh, scientific journals such as ACM and IEEE. Dr. King is now the chief sci scientist officer at Test.ai, a company that's focusing on uh, using uh, uh, artificial intelligence in the field of software testing, which is now becoming a very critical um, concept in our uh, software testing profession. Um, again, one more time, we're very proud, we're very pleased to have uh, Dr. King with us today. Uh, he's a very busy man, but um, I was surprised myself that, for, that he accepted uh, to speak uh, uh, and present this webinar for us. Um, with no further ado, I'd like you to please welcome uh, Mr. King. And uh, uh, Mr. King, please go ahead, you have uh, the microphone. Uh, thank you very much, Magdi. And um, yeah, thanks uh, in general to uh, all of you for, for being here and taking the time out. And the um, International Institute for Software Testing, I mean, it's very um, good to be kind of a part of this, this forum. Um, so today we're going to uh, really dive into something that's very close to my uh, heart because it was actually a topic that I focused my PhD on. Um, but I think at the time that I was doing my doctorate, uh, there wasn't a lot of the advances in technology to help realize a lot of the things that um, challenges that needed to be solved. And now some of that technology and, and the data surrounding it has, has caught up. Uh, and so I don't normally give a lot of talks about the future, <laughs> but um, uh, you know, th there's something that I see in terms of a trend happening. And I think uh, as a testing community, we have to uh, really uh, get behind it. Um, so. Uh, just a little bit about myself. Um, I did, did a great introduction there, uh, but uh, just for those of you that that, that don't know me, um, there's kind of a, a different path that I took, which is very academic. I actually got introduced to software testing uh, at Florida Tech, where um, Ken Kaner and James Whitaker were professors, and you could take their courses in software testing and, and get credit for taking a testing course twice uh, because they were such different minds, uh, great minds in, in software testing. And then I went on to FIU to do my PhD, uh, focused on um, trying to build self-testing systems, and that's where the topic comes from today. Uh, I spent uh, a stint at IBM as a research fellow, uh, working also with the software testing group there. And then I decided that industry wasn't really the path for me and decided to uh, join academia. I joined NDSU uh, in Fargo, North Dakota as an assistant professor, uh, spent three years at NDSU, and, um, you know, going through the tenure track, uh, I think also helped prepare me, uh, but I would eventually want to kind of get back into a company um, uh, that um, had a, a good culture. And so I found Ultimate Software, which is an HR and payroll company in Western Florida. And most of my um, industry career was spent there, first as a test architect, then I went up through the ranks as a manager, director, and then the head of their quality program. Uh, and as part of that journey, I was also in charge of research and development. And we started working on leveraging AI and machine learning for software testing. Basically, my boss came to me and said, hey, what do you think is the future? Uh, we want to do some moonshot projects here at Ultimate. And I said, the future of testing, I think, is that in the future, the machines will probably test themselves. And so that's how that journey started for me. And I would eventually then leave Ultimate in 2019 and join Test AI. Uh, which is a startup company that um, was founded by Jason Arbin, uh, also a, a testing nerd and guru like myself. Uh, and, um, and we would kind of go on this venture. Uh, so I would join there as the chief science, science officer, as Mike D said. So uh, that's been my career. Uh, it's been very exciting so far and looking forward to see where everything goes. Um, but what we're seeing, I think we're continuing to see this movement towards DevOps. And sometimes, you know, this is 
something that there's usually some contesting with, with testing and talking about bottlenecks. But the goal is to combine software development with IT operations to have a holistic view of the development cycle and move towards these faster releases and shorten that cycle. And um, I think people like to kind of look at the tension that there can be with, you know, what is usually referred to manual testing processes with this. Um, but I think that the move towards DevOps and continuous delivery has to account for delivering high quality software. Otherwise, you're just delivering bad software fast, which doesn't help anyone. Um, and so, you know, testing is really an integral uh, part of this. So you normally find your um, traditionalists that are all about shift left, right? So testing must be performed before the application is released to production. And this is actually where most of the testing has been focused on for the past few decades. Uh, on the other side, there's this idea of shift right and, you know, thinking about how can we actually uh, focus more on what is happening in production and use that information to realize what is testing in production. And for the traditionalists, they, they normally freak out when you hear that. <laughs> testing in production is like, well, what do you mean? That's a very risky thing and we, we shouldn't do that. And so you have this shift left and shift right. And sometimes it just feels that we're, we're stuck in the middle um, these days between the shift left and the shift right. Uh, so a few months ago, I was at the Agile Testing Days conference and there was a, a talk by uh, Jan Yat. And, and this was a, a good talk. It was a talk on shift right. Um, and one of the things that he mentioned during the, the conversation was that testing and production is a major risk. And, um, you know, again, going back to like more of the traditionalist view, this is usually the, the communication that comes out. And as I was sitting there, I was like, yeah, but maybe it doesn't have to be a major risk. And also, when you really stop and think about it, not testing in production can also be a major risk because we're trying to estimate or guesstimate, you know, what will happen and what customers will do and the kinds of data they will have. And that's a very hard problem. And so we always know that when we ship, that we're going to ship with bugs, right? That presence of bugs will always be there uh, going back from our fundamental uh, testing theories, uh, you know, Dijkstra, we can only show the presence of bugs, but never the absence. And with that in mind, it, it means that, uh, you know, this problem of, you know, figuring out what the users will do and figuring out what production will be like uh, is just a hard problem. And, you know, Whitaker says that we should stop acting like users, that real users don't have to act. And this is some of the motivation for the conversation today is really because I think um, we have to start to realize that uh, maybe there's other ways that we can, you know, try to uh, get better at software testing. And uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be that we never test in production because we're thinking that that's too much of a risk. And so there's, there's power in that. Right, and there's power, I think, in you know testing in production. Um, so the fundamental thing is that some scenarios are very difficult to produce in a test lab, and so while you want your testers to wear your user hats, uh, there is a better way, <laughs> ideally, which is to have real users test the application in production environments, and um, the key benefit is that you're talking about having information about the actual system and how it really behaves in the real world using real users and real data, right? Uh, so there's a lot, as opposed to modeling and abstracting and estimating and you know doing the lab work. And again, there's, there's value in both. So there's things that you can do, monitor user profiles and, and really use the information from production there's things like ABN experiments that you do using real users to give feedback and then flow that into uh, development. There's the idea of testing as a feature, which is really saying, let our products have uh, embedded feedback that the users can give about bugs, right? So a little screen capture tool, a little form, I found this issue, here it is. As, as a real user, it's important to me and they can submit it and then that flows straight into the development teams. Um, and, you know, of course, our triage and, and prioritize. So, uh, you know, this is just cursory as some of the, you know, general sentiments of how we can get closer to production that are going on today. And, 
you know, for me, it has really been a charge to say uh, to all of my testers, um, there's value in executing tests in production. And so from now on, we test in production and we stop being afraid and try to figure out how we can actually safely test in production. And, you know, it really becomes the question is if you're going to be a, a Spartan when you're testing in production or you're going to be a Persian, um, it, meaning that, you know, we have to remember that testing in production does not mean or is not equivalent to insufficient pre-production testing. One does not preclude the other or stop the other from moving forward. And actually, if you um, have been in this field for any time, you know that real testing has to do with mixing and matching techniques, right? And it means that this is a technique where we have testing in production, and then there's a, a technique uh, or techniques associated with testing pre-production, and we should find the right balance. And, and that balance can be based on, on risk. Um, and so, you know, once we start getting into um, this idea of testing and production, it's, it's important to recognize that there's pros and cons. And um, the first obvious thing, which is what keeps everyone scared, is that, you know, we could break production functionality or, God forbid, we actually uh, corrupt uh, production data that belongs to our customers, right? Um, and of course, if we're going to test in production, then we need to actually interrupt, in some cases, functionality that may be in use. And so you have a very narrow window to go in there, run those tests, and then restore the system back to regular mode of operations, right? There's, if you're testing in production on the same um, infrastructure and nodes, then you have a risk of performance degradation. You have security, compliance, you have all these issues that you have to uh, think about. Um, but on the flip side, there's a, a lot of benefits and some we talked about already in terms of the real world aspects of what you get. Um, you can now actually get into a mode where you're uh, getting uh, feedback quickly from users, preventing bad deploys from happening. Uh, you know, reproducing bugs is you now something that's a lot easier to do because you have the kind of production environment where the bug originated to start looking and investigating. And it, it really boils down to the fact that we can use testing in production as a tool to help us make sure of two critical things, that the system is actually production ready and that um, also, you know, by, by focusing on this type of testing, we can actually help uh, impact the design of the system to help make sure that the system is actually very resilient. And we'll talk a little bit about, about that because that ties into the idea of designing the system for testing or testability and, and building in self-testing capabilities and what is needed to do that and how that can also help other aspects of the, um, the software. All right, so, uh, First, we'll get into tip, and then we'll we'll transition into um, what are some promising approaches to uh, actually uh, realizing testing in production, and, and where I see AI and machine learning uh, fitting in. So, one of the first things uh, that's very obvious out there when it comes to testing in production is the idea of canary testing. It comes from the days of coal mining, where there was carbon monoxide in the mines, and so you would put a canary in the mine, a small canary, and you would watch it. <laughs> if it started to, to look like it was dying, then everyone out of the mines, right? So, so here we're talking about testing out new features or versions of the software uh, with a percentage of the real users in a production environment. And so with this canary test, some users are seeing a new feature uh, or version of the application, uh, but they're seeing it in a production environment. Uh, there's also the idea of dry run testing, which is very useful. You run a, a test scenario in production, but you do it without side effects, right? In other words, you're trying to play it safe while you're in production. So you might, for example, take a transaction all the way through to the end of the form, but you may not submit or, or, or save, right? Um, so doing those dry runs. Uh, there's also the idea of a dark launch, uh, also called shadowing or mirroring. So you send a copy of real user generated traffic to some new service that you're building. And you know you kind of discard uh, a lot of the 
uh, results from the new service before it's actually returned to the user. Um, so uh, again, all of these are approaches where you're saying that you want to uh, test, but you don't want to have bad things happen, right? Um, so there's the Dart launches, and sometimes that's associated with feature flags and, and stuff like that, but I like to separate Dart launch um, because the idea of the, the traffic uh, is something that I don't want to uh, forget about, right? A feature toggle is just turning on and off a feature, but if you're simulating uh, the request and, and testing it out, it's a good end-to-end -end testing approach. And then there's the idea of stage rollouts, of course, a deployment strategy that really builds on the idea of canary testing. So now the rollout is, is staged in the sense that there's these different tiers where you introduce new features in production to uh, more customers and you have provisions there for rolling back uh, or even rolling forward uh, if you want to make sure that you fail fast and fix things right uh, there's having test accounts and sandboxes in production we did this a lot at ultimate software uh, we'd have actual production environment but it was really just for testing and you know um, handling data and setting up that data and you know was, was a challenge but nonetheless was also very valuable and then last but not least is the idea of dog fooding right in marketing if you're going to sell dog food right you should try it first <laughs> and so this is the idea of doing internal testing uh, with users that are representative of you know your end users so again for example at ultimate we were hr and payroll company well we built HR and payroll software, but we had an HR department and we had payroll folks on board and people that dealt, dealt with benefits and different things. So we could leverage them to do internal testing or to do this uh, dog fooding approach. So the idea here is that testing in production is really being embraced by the community. Uh, we are seeing it pop up at uh, conferences. These are all speakers that have had talks on testing in production. Um, uh, and have some upcoming talks. Actually, Nicholas' talk is is coming up in November at ATD 2022. And so, I think it's something that, again, from a trending standpoint, we are we're seeing come into play related to DevOps. Also related to the fact that uh, we have this playground that is kind of unexplored, uh, mainly because we've been a little bit hesitant to mess things up in production, and some of it is justified. Uh, but it doesn't justify not trying to innovate and find creative ways to do it. And so, as I mentioned, um, you know, this this talk isn't really about testing and production. It's really a bit more than that. Um, testing and production just happens to be like this foundation where I see the future of testing going. Um, and, you know, I'm actually breaking some rules when I do this because I, I don't normally talk about the future, right? Uh, I feel strongly, though, that there's uh, a big path forward because of the way that data is ubiquitous, the data the way that we're seeing the, the trends in shift right and so on and so forth, and that we need to figure out how to navigate this world safely. And, and beyond that, how to build automation and use intelligent tools that are connected to these embedded production environments um, to kind of you know, make testing uh, better and make testing scale. And if we've been seeing anything, this global pandemic has taught us that, um, you know, we have to find more uh, creative ways to build automation. And I'm not talking about automation, like we kind of referred to it today, where we're manually encoding scripts for Selenium or for JUnit or, or to do that sort of stuff. That's still a very manual process. When I say automation, I'm really talking about how, um, uh, the research body of knowledge around how to generate tests automatically, how to solve the Oracle problem. Like these are all far reaching and kind of very hard problems that are still open problems, uh, but there's progress in pockets in, in different places, right? And how do you get those things to migrate into industry? Because quite frankly, a lot of it still exists only in, in academia. And, um, you know, I really think that automation as we kind of know it that we are living in a, a new era of automation and we're going to push more and more on the machines and the idea back in the 50s around manufacturing was to have this idea of lights out automation and 
you know, lights out manufacturing, sorry, lights out manufacturing was that, you know, we have so much automation in the factory that we don't need humans to kind of stand up and monitor the machines or operate the machines. Um, but we don't have that same kind of philosophy uh, when it comes to uh, testing. A lot of testing is focused on uh, just mainstream testing in industry is, is geared towards manual effort, right? And what do I mean when I say that? I mean, well, okay, the manual generation and creation of testing, I actually hate the word manual testing. I think we just call it testing right now. Um, but these scripts that we're building and running and maintaining aren't really very automated. The uh, automation happens only upon execution. Uh, again, all of the design of the tests and the crafting and the thinking that goes into all the learning of the application, all of those things are not currently very automated in mainstream industry. And, you know, a few years ago, I think uh, Jason and I had this kind of vision of, you know, testing without humans, right? Uh, lights out testing to give the manufacturing analogy. And of course, we're still very far away from that. Uh, but uh, again, the whole idea of a dream is to kind of help it to motivate your vision moving forward. And, you know, you can be guided by that, that vision. And so I think that we have to take the reins off and stop thinking that certain things in testing and test automation are impossible and start just looking at the innovations around us that are happening. And I remember meeting um, Roy Oshiro. Uh, Roy was um, a speaker at the Hustaf organization. And um, I gave a, I was the program chair in 2019 and Roy um, gave a keynote talking about uh, what is the pipeline driven organization. And he said, you know, in traditional organizations, even though automated pipelines for testing and delivery exist, uh, they are not the things that are making the decisions. Humans are still making the decisions. But he put forward this idea of a pipeline-driven organization. We're saying that the experts from various categories of work spend their time teaching the pipelines how to make decisions using automated tests, right? And in this way, we can trust the pipeline and help it move forward. And I thought this was very interesting because I know Roy wasn't necessarily talking about, when he said teaching the pipelines, he wasn't talking about necessarily AI and machine learning. He was just talking about the fact that the experts are there informing the tests in terms of what goes into them and so on and so forth. Um, but if, if you take that a step further and we see, you know, AI and machine learning being used to help um, teach machines how to do medical diagnoses, right? Or how to drive a car, right? There, there's all of these uh, kind of things that normally would require um, human experts to be able to do that machine learning is doing. So he got me thinking a lot about um, how this uh, idea of AI and machine learning and closing the gap with um, automated testing as we know it today, combined with DevOps practices and pipelines and continuous delivery and decision-making uh, about delivery, how can we kind of marry all of that together, right? Um, and you know, software really has become a lot more dynamic. So it's not just that AI and machine learning can help us um, move testing forward, but we actually need <laughs> to have testing be an integral part of these types of systems, right? When you start talking about uh, recommendation systems or self-driving cars, um, you know, we have all of this adaptive behavior and you can't actually test these things adequately uh, offline or pre-production only because the actual success can't be measured at that point. For example, for recommendation system, you need to start looking at how are users actually using your recommendations and viewing the recommendations, right? Is, are they clicking the recommendations? Are they converting over and actually buying the products or watching the movies or whatever it is? And what is happening in between there? Are they abandoning stuff, right? So this connection to production to actually be able to evaluate the success, which is an essence testing, right? The system is something that, you know, has now by default had to move into the runtime, right? And we can certainly do some testing pre-production, 
but at the end of the day, we need to monitor these things to know if what we've built is actually working for the users that are using it and, and things change, right? So, um, and of course, the other part of that is when you start thinking about um, testing adaptive systems and the other uh, case of a self-driving car is that, you know, some of these failures can be catastrophic, right? It can be, you know, you're not talking just about losing money, you're talking about human lives, right? And so if that is the case, then there is definitely a need for um, testing practices to be a central theme. And so this is kind of what brings it back to, again, in 2009, I, I graduated and I, I did a, a thesis uh, entitled A Self-Testing Approach for Autonomic Software. And um, back then, um, IBM was pushing their idea of autonomic computing, Microsoft and, and others. There was like the Dynamic Systems Initiative and HP had their own uh, adaptive computing uh, model. Everyone was talking about these systems being able to self-configure, self-heal, self-protect, and so on and so forth. And um, as a you know, student in school who was studying computer science and had grown up, uh, kind of looking into testing, we were like, well, how? no one was talking about the fact that if we're going to do all this dynamic behavior, if you're going to adapt this system and have autonomic computing, that testing need to be a central part of the system, right? In other words, in that mode where you're going to put this new configuration in place, and that is a dynamic change to the application, normally, if we were doing this in a software company, we would run regression tests and run some other tests and, and check out the configuration. And if it, if those tests pass, then we could release. Well, now that's happening at runtime. So we need to still do the testing at runtime. And so my graduate studies focused on that. And I came up with this architectural design uh, where we use a, an agent based approach um, to test these dynamic changes. And so these bots would monitor the software components um, when the adaptation occurred and then apply some of the same uh, infrastructure that was being used for the adaptation to also include testing. And at that time, I came up with two general approaches. And again, I think this was kind of way before its time, um, but I, I thought, okay, well, the first thing that you can do is that if you're gonna do testing, if you have to do testing on the production system, the first step is to bring that system into a safe state where some functions are partially blocked because you're gonna run tests on them. Then you implement whatever changes they are and then actually perform your testing in place on that live system. And then once the testing completes, the system will then remote return to that mode of full uh, operation. So that I call safe adaptation or validation. It built on some research by Betty Chang and, and one of her students on safe adaptation. And, and then the other approach was, well, okay, if I am not doing it in place, I can do it on a copy, but we would have to create and maintain these copies of the system under test or components under test, implement those changes on the copy, run your testing. And then if your test results were favorable, then you could you know, do a hot swap or you know, copy, uh, implement the change and you know, start using the, the new um, component. And you know, I look at that back then and, you know, see where things are today. And we have this idea of blue-green deployments or red-black deployments. And these are very similar things conceptually. And so when we start thinking about DevOps and where the movement has gone, I, I want you to recognize that DevOps actually supports this idea of self-testing, right? It's CICD actually requires continuous testing. We can't continuous deliver without continuous tests. And whether you're talking about shift left or shift right, you're talking about testing new code, testing every build, testing every deploy, and now this idea of testing in production. Um, so I, I really believe that the next shift that we're gonna see is a shift inwards, right? Where testing will need to be something that is ingrained in the design and um, the system will need to be able to test itself all the way from the component level uh, all the way up through integration and system testing. Um, and of course, that sounds like a grandiose thing, um, but if you look at how software teams are structured today and how testing is happening, you'll see that there's this movement towards this. 
um, it's just not being incorporated into the design. It is something that is still very much uh, after the system has been built. Um, but one thing that has been promising that I've been working with um, probably for the last four or five years is um, the microservices architecture. I think this is more evidence that we've been working on self-testing without knowing it. And uh, so the characteristics of microservices actually facilitate this idea of self-testing. And, and I'll, I'll relate it back to the two approaches that I um, talked to you about. One of the, for example, microservices, uh, the characteristics are resilient, clustered, monitored, and obviously they're independently uh, scalable. Um, but for example, with a microservices architecture versus a monolith, each of the components is now on a separate node, right? And so when you start thinking about that, you know, the system is designed and built in a way where you may expect, in this case, billing to be down or payments to be down, but the whole system doesn't have to be down with it so it can still function so when it, it comes to the idea of safe adaptation and those ideas that i was talking about now we're building systems in a way where i can easily disable parts of the software and run tests on them if i need to and and continue on that's part of the design the other thing is that um, because microservices are all about um, functionally decomposing the system uh, into um, these uh, small microservices, each microservice is, is clustered, meaning that you expect to be able to have more than one instance of a service available at any given time. And that helps with scaling and so on and so forth. Um, so now this idea of replication or using copies is actually, again, baked into the design of the system. So now I can create a new copy. I can update that version of that, that instance of that um, service. I can get a new version of payments out there, instantiate it and run testing and you know spin everything back down. So this actually sets us up for some of those ideas that again, I was talking about and I had to, of course, doing a PhD, you still have to run experiments. And I found myself a lot of time building systems to kind of prove things out and then applying my testing techniques and testing approaches. I didn't have microservices and architectures like that back then. So, so we're moving towards this. Um, we also see this kind of notion of containers, you know, bridging the gap between dev and production. So all the dependencies are self-contained and you can pass these things around. Um, and so we're seeing this kind of production ready testing because the containers that you're using in dev have all the same um, dependencies and stuff within them and you deploy that same container to production, right? So again, we're seeing this gap between uh, the lab and production. All right, so let's talk a little bit about AI and machine learning and where um, I also see that everything that I've been doing from that standpoint and looking at uh, aspects of how to apply AI to software testing also seem to be supporting or, or giving this recurring theme of self-testing software and systems. So. Uh, we've seen a lot of uh, work uh, using uh, computer vision to do UI testing, for example, and build uh, more resilient test automation, moving away from um, these hard-coded uh, CSS selectors that break and, and saying, if the machine technology is where it can identify the shopping cart, just like a human would visually, and we can train the machines with that uh, machine vision component, then let's do that right, uh, from the UI standpoint. Or um, let's use the idea of reinforcement learning to help us to navigate the application and crawl it automatically um, to determine and explore what this application behavior is like, and then we can extend that to look for issues and problems, right? And that is also a very um, uh, resilient thing. And so I've been uh, working in this space, not just at the UI level, that's where we started, um, but I actually wrote, uh, uh, article for O'Reilly called AI Driven Testing. And it, it focused on the fact of looking at different ways that AI and machine learning can be applied at the unit level, the service level, uh, the UI level, and then also across different quality attributes like AI for performance testing or AI for security and so on and so forth, right? Um, and so, you know, these are all things where I think that the, the future where 
um, AI is kind of bridging the gaps on our capabilities for doing certain things dynamically and simulating human judgment and so on and so forth. You know, back in the day, you thought about automation and thinking, well, how can I validate whether or not a design is good or bad, a, a UI design, for example? You know, there was no automation for that. And now we can feed the machines examples of good designs and bad designs and use this machine vision to actually uh, help us uh, simulate the judgment of human experts, right? Just like the medical diagnosis and leverage that for software testing or for the good of software testing, as I like to, to say. And last but not least, before I kind of open up for uh, questions is just understanding and, and putting out there that the fact that it is not just that, you know, software testing can benefit from AI and machine learning. There's an actual need for these systems that can now dynamically learn at runtime, systems are learning new things that we aren't really, you know, if we don't be careful, if we don't put the boundaries on it, uh, we have issues, right? So um, we need to start uh, thinking about uh, the fact that testing really needs to be a major part of um, the success of AI and machine learning, uh, because without those boundaries, it'll be chaos. Like people think, oh, you know, this whole idea of AI taking over and stuff is but there's some real concerns there um, with this technology and how it can impact us. So uh, I think that uh, AI for testing involves uh, testing AI. And, you know, if we can actually still leverage, you know, all the advances that we're gaining in the AI ML space in testing to help make it be a part of the runtime design of the system, then we can leverage that AI for actually testing a lot of the AI and machine learning systems. And the, the proof of, of, of this um, kind of trajectory for the future just uh, boils down to, I guess what, what is one of the biggest buzzwords right now is all about the metaverse, right? And um, I, I look at this and I said, well, if we actually figure out, metaverse doesn't exist today, but if you actually figure out what this metaverse uh, or these metaverses will look like, and we actually get it to work, just like the internet. It's a wonderful place to kind of playground and advances in competing. But if we don't figure out how to actually test <laughs> um, in this world with all these multiple computing devices connected together, we're you know navigating through these this world using multiple technologies, AR, VR, blockchain, NFTs, you know, there's all sorts of quality concerns on identity, reputation, ownership theft, fraud, privacy, you know. So we have to think about these things as we move forward and recognize that the software testing community um, is a necessary component in terms of making sure that these technologies can actually be uh, successful. All right, so I'll stop there. Make sure that we have plenty of time for questions. Well, well, I am looking here, and as I kind of expected, there are no questions from the audience, although nothing that says that we would not receive some questions soon. Um, I suspect that probably the information was uh, a bit um, overwhelming to some of the attendees. Uh, certainly, the idea is new to many of them. Um, I've known the idea for years, but still for myself until now, I still have my questions myself and I will have to ask my questions if we don't get enough uh, questions from the audience. Um, it's of course, I can, I can see the point of, of, of uh, self uh, testing in production. Um, and I'm glad um, uh, Dr. King that you made it very clear that testing in production does not by any mean uh, means that we don't do pre-production testing. Um, yeah. Testing in production will only complement what we are doing pre-production. Uh, the question now is enablers. How do we enable that as an organization that I have a test team? Uh, some of them are manual testers. Some of them are automation engineers who are used to writing those scripts. And of course, you and I and everyone else who knows that uh, those scripts do not really, it's, it's not automation. The, the automation is only the execution part of it. 
And as I tell people all the time, uh, bad scripts are going to only execute bad tests. So, <laughs> yeah. so it's not, it does not do anything. It's, it's, I, I agree with you 100%. It is not a test automation. Uh, for it yeah. to become a test automation is we need to automate the the design aspect of software testing. Now, the question for you, um, um, Tarek, is it's how how is it how an organization can go about doing that? Well, how do I look at this as a, as a CIO looking at this whole picture and I say this is great, this is great. We yeah. need to start to that. Where do yeah. I start? Where do I start? Do I need to hire? Uh, people with different kind of skills, and if so, what are what kind of skills do I do people need? What kind of infrastructure yeah. do we need? I'm going to let you explore on that. Yeah. So I'll say first of all, I mean, it's great, great question, and I think the first thing, um, even before you get into um, this hiring or staffing or anything, I think the first thing is to recognize that. Um, uh, of number one, that there's value in this and you want your organization to move in this direction. And so as a CIO or any kind of leader, my first thought is, well, you know, even if we are not testing in production yet, I want to make sure, because testing is all about mitigating risk, I wanna make sure that our lab and what we're doing in our testing lab is actually uh, something that is meaningful, that once the software goes out there, that we have, we're actually mitigating risks um, you know, as a part of our testing. So I think the first thing is to recognize that there's levels of this testing and production and that one level that every organization should be at, even if you're not testing anything in production, is leveraging the information. Information should flow, information about where our customers are spending their time in the application, information about the devices and platforms that they're using, uh, all this information that comes from, from production and from real users should be flowing into the testing organization and should be should be used to help prioritize the testing effort, again, in a risk-based manner. So if 95% of my customers are using Android phones and only 5%, this is probably not going to be ever true, and only 5% are using iPhones, uh, I know all the Apple fans are probably upset with me, um, then, then it, it, it doesn't make sense for me to uh, be spending all of this time you know, on that 5%, right? It, it makes sense, especially because we know that we have limited resources. Again, this could be anything from browsers, devices, anything. Um, and then the other part of it is, you know, once you start looking at uh, analytics information about, you know, user profiles and where customers are, are actually spending their time in the application, you may find out, you know, what those patterns look like and, and optimize your testing for that. Maybe it's even, a product decision, right? Like we, no one ever goes to this part of our app. Like, why do we even have it? Should we deprecate it or whatever, um, and stuff like that. So I think that that's you know our our first level is informed testing from production, and so uh, that's where I would start and setting goals and just asking and gathering that. Can we even get that information? And once we get that information, can the testing teams? use this information and incorporate it into their automation and whatever they're running, incorporate it into their exploratory testing and bug bashes and, and have that be a, a customary thing that that data comes out frequently or periodically and is updated so that folks are having a testing process that actually uh, tries to mirror or mimic a little bit of what is happening in production. And then you can go from that informed level uh, up a notch, right? Where you're now saying, okay, now that we have information about how these things are being done, maybe we identify that there's, um, you know, a, a few key customers or a few configurations that these customers are using um, that they're our most important clients, they're most critical, or maybe they're the most uh, risky from the standpoint of they're having more issues than everyone else. And so now, is it does it make sense for us to actually invest in building some test environments in production that mimic or mirror that um, you know configuration or those sets of configurations, right? So now you're taking it from just information to actually getting infrastructure in place. And then um, you know the next step is obviously start building around that infrastructure so that you can 
have people first maybe even do exploratory testing on there and use some of these techniques like the um, the dart um, dart launches or you know whatever testing and production techniques you would want to employ right um, and getting it done from a manual standpoint and then oh well, maybe we can actually have automation run on these environments and so on and so forth and of course the data becomes a hard problem privacy and so on and so forth so there's a lot of investment in setting up realistic data or being able to clean data um, and getting the consent to use that um, but sometimes we found that some clients have been more than willing to sign the right agreements to allow us to do this because they know that it's going to benefit them directly right um, so so now you move to that level of just doing even manual or exploratory testing in production on a separate environment right that is totally isolated no risk of breaking someone else but it is a production like environment and you have access to a very realistic you can call it staging but sometimes these are more specific than a staging environment in that they really mirror a particular set of configurations right and then the next level beyond that is now what you would think of as a lot of the advanced techniques that we kind of talked about here as part of the future right even applying ai machine learning doing this stuff automatically looking at you know all these um designs and um you know uh, hot swaps and all of these things that are again far out um but again part of it is, is vision and dream right so i would just start by just at least laying that ground zero and and then moving the organization upward slowly towards um you know something that's more comprehensive uh, there's a question from the audience asking about tools uh, okay. and i as i said i even had a more basic question uh, about tools as well so there are two, two folds of the question one if we're going to just start not exactly doing uh, in production testing but rather just as you said collecting data getting data acquiring data from production to use this in in our pre-production data our, our pre-production testing are there tools out there that can help us uh, in this data acquisition process to bring the data in uh, and the and the other part of the question from the audience says are there tools even to do the testing uh, uh, on these machine visions and test those metaverses yeah. i got you i got you yeah so yeah in terms of the first the first question or first part of the question um we're talking about a lot of the um which there is a big movement uh of right now and tooling around a lot of the monitoring uh tools that are out there right so you have a lot of these different uh, stacks, like the Elk stack, uh, Elasticsearch, and Logstash, and Kibana, when you're thinking about um, data and monitoring production and monitoring services and traffic, uh, or the TIG stack, right? Telegraph, InfluxDB, and Grafana. So it, it really doesn't matter what tool stack you use for that. The whole idea first is that you need to know what's happening in your, your cloud and in your production environments, right? And so getting these tools in place, um, and being able to get dashboards and pull that information out is step step one there. Um, in terms now of uh, talking about uh, more advanced tooling around uh, leveraging AI and machine learning uh, for different aspects of this, I think one of the first things that is um, once you have data, once you have your 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 stack together to pull your data, um, it's actually not hard to get. Um, useful analytics from that data uh, using those things. And of course, there's commercial tools like Splunk and so on and so forth, um, but actually with not so much effort, um, and with just a you know a few um, uh, kind of clustering algorithms and so on and so forth, you can actually um, leverage that data that you have from your cloud and produce some pretty useful analytics. And you can also have those analytics from the test lab be then mirrored and reflected to see if you have good coverage and and that sort of stuff of um, these production scenarios so uh, just thinking about uh, simple machine clustering or using analytics platforms like splunk um, you can definitely go that direction uh, in terms of some of the more advanced machine vision um, aspects of it 
Um, those are a little bit harder to come by. I mean, obviously I work for a company that we build those, um, that type of tooling. Um, but I would say that you're seeing more and more uh, vendors kind of go this direction. Uh, but there's actually a lot of pre-trained models out there. There's the Google, Google Cloud Platform and the uh, Auto ML Vision, um, where if you are wanting to have um, some exposure or experience to it, uh, you could head over to the Cloud Vision uh, website, and there's just a free widget there where you can play around with the API to see what vision capabilities are available to you in Google Cloud. And again, we're seeing more and more um, infrastructure as a service and platform as a service vendors offer some of these things as part of their offering. Uh, so that's also another option. And in terms of end-to-end -end kind of UI test automation using computer vision, uh, there's a, a company called DevTools AI that's also building uh, some cool integrations with popular existing testing frameworks like Selenium and Cypress and so on and so forth. So you can check out devtools.ai. And I can I can make sure that Magdi has all these these links. Um, and what was the name of the first company or the first product? Slung, you said? Splunk, S-P-L-U-N-K. Yeah, oh yeah, okay. Okay. Yeah. All right, I'm just uh, sending an answer yeah. to uh, everyone here with these two tools. Yeah, and, and actually like, you know, and, and Splunk is a great uh, offering, but when we first started at, at Ultimate, um, we didn't have that kind of tooling. And what we did was first, we set up the out stack and we got our data. And then it was not that hard to get um, a few engineers to figure out how to um, put together some clustering algorithms to get us the information that we wanted. Um, so, and it's just applying these clustering algorithms and modeling the, the data and so on and so forth, right? So. Uh, it was useful, right? Um, yeah. Without much effort as a starter. So you don't have to go and buy uh, enterprise level tools sometimes, you know. All right, uh, I'm just gonna ask one last question here. Um, of course, you can imagine the, the current software testing community will say, well, does this mean that I will be eliminated? And the answer is obvious. No, no, you will not be eliminated because Tarek made it very clear that pre-production testing is still essential. We just need to do more. And because we can learn much, much more from production. So, the, yeah. so, so, uh, so, but the question is now not, a, not about will I be eliminated? The, the question is about how much, uh, and I know you're, you're very aware of the current skill level of the test professionals out there. What's the percentage of the current test profession you think can move forward towards uh, testing production? Um, do, do, do you think, is there anyone, any, any percentage we can ever, we can use, or we're going to need a, a, a totally different kind of a skill set? Yeah, so you're 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 right in that. Like, um, you know, I have spent a lot of time. A lot of my actual focus has been on on education and career growth, and actually helping to transition uh, some folks. Um, you know, uh, my my team and myself, we went through a transition uh, with some of these things, right? Uh, just the AI, the machine learning aspects of it, um, just the technical aspects of microservices and all of the, I mean, this is our huge things. And I spend a lot of time at different forums and conferences, teaching tutorials um, on microservices testing, beginning uh, or starting out with AI and machine learning for testers. And, you know, one of the things, even from unit testing, I first started out, I remember my first um, tutorial ever, I approached one of the program organizers and I said, hey, I would love to give a hands-on tutorial on unit testing. And the program chair looked at me and said, oh, I don't think you'll get anyone signing up for that. Like most of our testers are just doing functional testing. And, and I was I was bummed out by that, but I told him, well, just give me an opportunity um, and see if how it goes. And uh, luckily, like I had like 30 people in that first one, but the, the, the career trajectory of the testing community was also shifting away from being so shy on the technology. And now we're seeing a, a bigger push towards these things. 
And with DevOps, I think that has become more evident. So I'm not saying that like, you know, there's not work to be done and skills that need to be, you know, uh, uh, leveled. Um, but what I'm also going to say is that um, while that might have been true, especially a few years ago, now we're seeing that the tooling that is coming into place are things that are very pretty user friendly and don't require a lot of technical depth. So you don't, if you're building these frameworks, of course, you need to be deep on all these things. But to start using some of these frameworks and, and getting familiar with them, I think that we have a good percentage of, of the testing community that can eventually uh, get these things there. And then the other thing is the value that you bring to that table. Um, you know, machine learning and AI and all these things are, there's a, a lot of similarities with software testing, right? You training using data, you um, training the machine and evaluating whether or not, um, you know, this uh, input maps to this output and these things, these are, these are testing problems that we do all the, all the time. And so there's a set of skills that, that testers come with by default that some other folks don't have. And, and that is um, really a testament of the, you know, I've done a lot of stuff with O'Reilly as well and, and taught data scientists from all over. And they always ping me after and say, this was a great course. And I'm like, these are, these are professional data scientists at, at big companies, but bringing them the testing mindset has helped to really help and enhance and improve uh, what they do, right? Because uh, it's not just precision and recall, as we know, to deliver a good product, right? So I, I would say there's work, but there's also benefits. And it's really about um, looking at the curriculum and the career path and what you want to do. And there's plenty of, of, of courses and material out there and I can help point people to stuff. I, I, I do these trainings myself and I know you guys have a huge curriculum at, at the Institute as well. So it'd be good to see these topics being taught there in the context of testing. Yes, I think we have to work hard on on uh, equipping people with those uh, with this material that they need in order so that they don't get disappointed when they start actually doing um, yeah just in production uh, well i have to be sensitive to your time and our audience time um tarik thank you so much I really thank you so much i've learned a lot myself during this presentation thanks for allowing uh, uh, our audience to uh, to learn from you thank you by the way for accepting to join the uh, advisory board of the internet of the international institute for software testing um, we're proud to have you there uh, thanks to everyone for being with us. Uh, Tarek, thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you so Mike. Thank you. Bye-bye.